The Bell XV-15 was the culmination of the efforts begun in the 1950s to build a functional hybrid tilt-rotor aircraft, a breed between a helicopter and a plane with vertical takeoff and landing, and with hoverability and high-speed forward flight. Though the XV-15 was the second successful experimental tilt-rotor aircraft built by the U.S. Air Force, it was the first to demonstrate high-speed performance relative to helicopters. The NASA and Army group leader for the XV-15 program, LG Shorty Shorers, stated that, quote, the tilt rotor is a novel type of aircraft that incorporates the low-speed capabilities of a helicopter, plus it can convert and fly as an airplane. Some people say that you can't have the best of both worlds, but you can. Tilt Rotor Technology The idea for a vertical takeoff and landing, or VTOL, aircraft with helicopter-like rotors in its wingtips first originated in the 1930s. The first such designs to appear on paper belonged to England and Germany, but they were never developed. There was also a known visionary model design from the United States dating back to 1946, but the technology was not ready. For decades, designers wanted to take advantage of the capabilities of tilt rotors, including how their configuration could be modified depending on the mission requirements. When operating as a helicopter, tilt rotors could deliver payloads with half the fuel in a conventional helicopter at distances of over 185 kilometers. In addition, Takeoff and landing terminals could be small, which was ideal for intercity commuting. The first prototypes to make it to flight were the transcendental models 1G and 2. The first one flew in the mid-1950s and was the first tilt rotor aircraft to fly and accomplish most of the helicopter to aircraft transition in flight. However, it crashed in July of 1955 and the prototype was destroyed. Meanwhile, Model 2 was developed later but didn't fly beyond hover tests. The U.S. Air Force then withdrew funding in favor of the Bell XV-3, which flew in 1955. The second B-3 was the first tilt rotor to reach full conversion in history. It remained a testbed until the program ended in 1966 and served as a full-scale wind tunnel model to test rotor wing interaction. Early tilt rotor designs had a major problem with the drive shafts, which carried too much weight from the fuselage to the wingtips. They also transferred substantial amounts of power and torque considerable distances for an aircraft-powered transmission system. The V-3 had instability issues in the final phases of testing, as well as limited performance and a deficient engine for vertical takeoff. But it proved that the problems involved the available technology rather than the concept itself. From the late 1960s to the early 1970s, NASA and a body of researchers worked on theoretical wind tunnels of several rotor pods to solve the instability issue. Two companies, Bell Helicopter Textron and Boeing Vertol were involved in developing solutions of their own, though with funding from the Army, Air Force, and NASA. A competition for two half a million dollar contracts for prototype designs ensued, and both companies submitted their own models when the program launched in 1971 at NASA Ames Research Center. Other companies, such as Sikorsky Aircraft and Grumman Aircraft, also responded. The focus was placed on tilt rotor pods and their integration with the fuselage, as well as the study of the airflow as they tilted. Both fixed and folding rotors were analyzed. Research and development contracts were eventually issued to Bell and Boeing, which submitted its Model 222, not to be confused with the conventional Bell 222 helicopter. Boeing's design had fixed engines and pods at the end of each wing, and a smaller rotating pod with a rotor closer to the fuselage. The configuration simplified the engine design, keeping it horizontal at all times and eliminating the need for drive shafts. Meanwhile, Bell's Model 301 had whole wingtip pods that rotated with the engine and rotor assembled in the same pod, alternating horizontal and vertical positions. Power transmission was simplified, but it complicated the engine design. Ultimately, the Bell model prevailed, as it solved the V3 problems, and the company was awarded a contract in July of 1973. Development The concept required a complex engine design so that the pods could shift from horizontal to vertical operation, but those challenges were addressed early in the Proof of Concept program. Bell's experimental aircraft also introduced a significant design advantage. Instead of fitting the engines in the fuselage, they were mounted in the rotating wingtip pods, directly coupled to the rotors. It had a path of power straight from the engine into the speed reduction gearbox and into the rotor propeller without the need for elongated shafts. A drive shaft along the wings was placed for emergency use to transfer power in case of engine failure, but it did not usually carry power loads. The now called XV-15 was therefore lighter. Twin Lycoming T-53 turboshaft engines powered the XV-15 while connected by cross-shaft, and they drove three-bladed 25-foot diameter rotors, 
a size extensively tested in wind tunnels. The engines and main transmissions of the wingtip nacelles tilted as a single unit. Rotor pylons tilted from a vertical to horizontal position to eliminate speed barriers caused by a hazardous flight condition known as a retreating blade stall. While the fastest helicopters could fly at 370 km per hour, the Bell XV-15 reached a top speed of 550. For takeoff, the prop rotors and the engines were positioned straight up and directed thrust downward for a vertical climb. In BTOL mode, the XV-15 could lift off and hover for about an hour, and the rotors could be placed at any angle so that they didn't affect speed control. As LG Shorty Shorers, the NASA and Army group leader for the program said, quote, and then it can go all the way to airplane mode, and then it's a two-engine turboprop. The prop rotors rotated continuously to a horizontal position within 10 to 15 seconds while the speed was increased and the lift transferred to the wings. Shorers added, quote, so you're accelerating from hover to 160 knots in 13 seconds. A pretty good kick. In airplane mode, the aircraft could fly forward for two hours. It then had to return to helicopter mode for a vertical landing, and the engines had to be slightly modified to run vertically as well as horizontally. The conversion process required hydraulic and electrical systems to prevent failures, so that it could still happen even if one system failed. There was also a possibility that the rotors didn't get to the upright position for landing, which would be the equivalent of failing to deploy the landing gear of a regular airplane. According to Shorers, it was, quote, about the same order of risk and complexity. A hybrid flight control system was necessary. The airplane controls were constantly in operation, even in hover, and no movement was generated because there was no airflow over its surfaces. But after the transition into forward flight, the aerodynamic surfaces became effective as the helicopter controls phased out. After four years of engineering and testing, the development process was completed. Two prototypes were created. The first one, N702NA, flew in March of 1977. After relatively few flying tests, it was sent to the Ames Research Center in California for extensive wind tunnel testing in simulated flight environments. Eventually, it was moved to NASA Dryden at the Edwards Air Force Base, where flying tests showed the successful operation of both flying modes and smooth transitions between them. Then. After it was sufficiently tested, the prototype was sent back to Ames. Meanwhile, the second prototype, N703NA, was the first to complete the full conversion from helicopter to aircraft and back without a glitch. Operation History Despite its design complexity, the XV-15 was not difficult to fly. Ronald M. Gerties, a research pilot, related, quote, When people come on a tour, depending on their level of technical knowledge, I tell them the airplane is really easy to fly, and it is. I've said that I can put anybody who has pilotry experience, whether it be helicopter or fixed wing or both, put them in there, and with a thorough briefing before that, of course, put them in a seat, and I can sit there and coach them through a flight, and never probably have to put my hands on the controls. It's really that straightforward. In 1981, the XV-15 was taken for a demonstration at the Paris Air Show. The New York Times published that, quote, if ever there was a lovable plane, it is the Bell XV-15. The machine, the hit of the show, performed a series of maneuvers including bowing to the crowd. Several officials, including Senator Barry Goldwater and Navy Secretary John Lehman, were given guest co-piloting flights to promote the technology within the military. And the Fédération Aeronautique Internationale classified it as Rotodyne, and as such, it holds the record speed of 456 km per hour and the 3 and 6 km time to climb. The XV-15 became part of the standard air show at Moffett Field Naval Air Station in the 1980s. Both prototypes were actively flown throughout the decade, testing applications for civilian and military aircraft types to come. Bell Helicopter and Boeing Bertal then submitted a joint bid for an enlarged version of the XV-15 in 1983. The resulting preliminary design contract led to the Bell Boeing B-22 Osprey, the first production tilt rotor. Back at Bell, the first prototype crashed in August of 1992 while being flown by a test pilot. A bolt slipped out of the collective control system while lifting for a final hover, causing the rotor to go to full pitch. The aircraft then turned upside down and crashed. The pilot and co-pilot escaped with minor injuries, and the structure was found virtually intact. It was later transformed into a flight simulator. The second prototype was used to support tests for the V-22 Osprey military tilt rotor program. After service, it was retired and donated to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. It is currently on display at Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center at Washington Dulles International Airport. The Bell XV-15 was ultimately a superlative research aircraft. 
In its five years and almost 700 flight hours, the conversion system didn't fail even once. Thank you for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, please give us a thumbs up and leave us a comment. And for more information about historical feats and military developments, feel free to subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels.